Hello, my name is Joe Coppins. I'm with the Michigan Military Technical and Historical Society in East Point, Michigan. Today I am outfitted as a soldier in the First World War. I'm representing an infantryman in the Michigan National Guard in the 125th Infantry Regiment, Company B. The Michigan National Guard was in a state of readiness at the beginning of the Great War and would be among the first units sent over to fight in France. The uniform that I am wearing, beginning at my head, is a Model 1911 campaign hat. The blue cord signifies infantry. This is a great cap for, or hat for uh, out west on the Pioneer, keeping the sun off of my neck or down on the Mexican border, but it doesn't travel very well, and as you'll see in a moment, would be replaced by something a little bit more practical for the trenches of France. The shirt that I'm wearing would be worn under a coat typically, and it's made of wool. There's a lightweight cotton version for warm weather and tropical environments. And I'm wearing wool breeches, also an olive drab. And again, there's a khaki cotton uh, summer and tropical version. Protecting my shins and keeping debris from my marching shoes are canvas leggings. You'll also see these would be replaced once overseas. They didn't prove practical in the muddy trenches. My shoes are Model 1912 marching shoes. They could uh, take a shine, and the soles are leather. Doesn't give a whole lot of uh, traction on muddy or grassy surfaces. So you'll see in a moment, much of this would be modified or replaced once overseas. All right, now I'm back in how a soldier would have appeared over in France in the summer, winter of 1917 or into 1918. As you can see, my headgear has changed. That soft hat doesn't travel very well, and a metal helmet makes more sense in the trenches where there's fragments from incoming artillery shells that maybe weren't a direct hit, but they're falling in and causing head injuries. So most major powers adopted some form of head protection. Now it won't stop a bullet, it's more of a hard hat to prevent unnecessary casualties just due to things flying around. This is a British pattern that the U.S. adopted and they adopted it as the Model 1917. On my chest you'll notice a large canvas bag. This is a gas mask. This is also British. Inside is the filter and the mask. This mask was pretty uncomfortable to wear as it pinched your nose and you breathe through a snorkel that went through the filter housed on the chest. A French mask, which was a thick gauze pad, which you'll see shortly, was issued until the spring of 1918. Young men, enduring a long gas attack, would take it upon themselves to change from the more effective British mask to the French mask in the middle of a chemical environment, inhale a lung full of toxic chemical gas, and succumb to it there in the trench. So those masks were withdrawn. They were still being used by medics as a casualty couldn't keep the snorkel in their mouth if they were unconscious. Also in here is a small booklet to keep track of the usage of the mask as the filter would need to be replaced periodically. It also contains tape to patch any holes in the tube. So the soldier would be expected to maintain his gas mask. And this was very important as gas chemical warfare was being used in an attempt to break the stalemate at the front line with the trench warfare. On top of the mask, I have my bandolier carrying additional ammunition. My primary load of ammunition is on my belt. Each of these pockets holds two five-shot clips for my rifle. U.S. rifle, caliber 30, model 1903. This particular one was made in 1908 at Rock Island Arsenal. Loads from a five-shot clip. These are all inert, but the correct size. That would be put in the guide and the rounds would be stripped off into the action. The action would then be closed, fired, and then manually operated, cocking the bolt, ejecting the spent shell, allowing the magazine 
to bring that next round up and then closed and locked to chamber the next round and I'm ready to fire again. That could be done much quicker than that in combat. The sight is adjustable out to a very wishful 2,800 yards. Um, the human eye is not gonna be able to see past five or 600 probably in the combat zone, but they had high hopes. This rifle is based on the rifle we'd be fighting, the primary German arm, the Mauser. Turn of the century when it was developed, they would just come out of the Spanish-American War, and the Spanish were using German, licensed German Mausers, and the Americans, armed with their first smokeless powder repeating arm, the Craig Jorgensen, really liked that stripper clip and how quickly the German rifles, the Spanish rifles, could be loaded. So U.S. Ordnance Board set about creating a copy. They would contact the Mauser company, their lawyers would talk, and they would pay royalties to the German company before shots were fired in the Great War. The cartridge would be a later contention point between DWM, German Arms Company, the parent organization, and the U.S. Arms Board, which would result in a lawsuit. Um, other features of this rifle are a cleaning kit housed in the butt trap. A metal oiler would contain oil as well as a brass pull through and brush for cleaning the bore. Other equipment mounted around my belt includes my canteen, a one quart aluminum water bottle, which is nested in a cup with a folding handle. Also a first aid kit. This is simply a gauze dressing housed in a metal case to keep it clean, dry, and uh, sterile. This would be used on me if I got hit. I wouldn't use this on a friend, I would, this is for me. On my back is my ni Model 1910. All of this web gear is Model of 1910. They've been working on it turn of the century alongside the rifle. The, it's a Model 1910 haversack. The suspenders are integral to the pack to bear the weight of both the belt and the pack. The outside pocket houses my mess kit, knife, fork, and spoon. The upper body houses my emergency ration if field kitchen hot food can't come up to me. This is essentially the same ration we've had since the Revolutionary War of hard bread, uh, hard tack, crackers, some sort of smoked or salted preserved meat, coffee and sugar. This is housed in metal containers to protect it from chemical attack. I also have my wash roll, toothbrush, tooth powder, soap, shaving soap, brush, razor, and a towel. The lower portion houses my raincoat, change of underwear, and a blanket rolled up in my shelter half. I would pair up with another soldier and we would put up our two-man pup tent. This is wishful thinking in the combat zone. Most of the time you're sleeping in the trench, sleeping in a dugout. You don't have the luxury of sleeping on dry ground under a tent. You'll notice that I've put on, it's hard to see under all this gear, but my coat, my pattern 1912 tunic. The collar discs indicate crossed muskets that I'm infantry from the United States and the 125th indicates my regiment, the Michigan National Guard. There's one internal pocket and the four outer pockets. Soldiers love pockets. All sorts of personal items would be uh, stuffed in them, including letter writing material, a Bible, lighters and smoking paraphernalia, games, any personal items they wanted to keep with them. My canvas leggings have been replaced with European style wool leg wraps or puttees, also in olive drab like everything else that I'm wearing. These dry quicker, the canvas once it got wet took a long time to dry and once it did dry would be stiff. The wool in its shingle like wrap would slough off mud as it dried and they would dry much quicker. To put it on you just start at the ankle and wrap to the top. There's a cotton tie that's wrapped around and then tied and tucked in. The shoes are also slightly different. Rather than a smooth, polishable uh, finish, the rough side of the leather is put out 
and it can absorb better wax or oil to waterproof them. Keeping your feet dry is very important. Standing in an underground trench that's filled with mud and water makes this very difficult, and you get trench foot. Also, for traction, hobnails and a heel plate have been added to the shoes. Okay, so some of the things that we have on the table here and on the floor in front of us are typical equipment of an uh, American soldier in the First World War. Uh, the United States entered, entered World War I in April of 1917. Uh, at that point in time, the war had been raging in Europe since 1914, and we were very much behind the curve on uh, military technology. So a lot of the things that we ended up going to war with were of European designs. Uh, the, the helmet, the gas mask, uh, the leggings that we would end up adopting were all things that, that the Europeans had already tested in battle. So, a lot of, so many of the things that we see here are actually battle-proven European designs that were then adopted and used uh, and manufactured here in the United States for the war. Okay, so there were a number of companies here in the uh, state of Michigan that manufactured items for the First World War. Uh, there were there are industries that existed in Michigan at that point in time that we probably don't really remember. We had a fairly robust uh, textile industry in the state still at that point, and because the auto companies had had centered here in the, in Michigan, there were a lot of there was a lot of production capability in the state already uh, that was capable of doing casting and stamping and and things of that nature that were then adopted to. Uh, Manu the manufacture of war goods. So the United States was, was only involved in the First World War for 18 months as a combatant. So most of the products that we manufactured here never made it overseas in time to see combat. Uh, by the time the industrial mobilization occurred and, everything, and the shipping issues were overcome and sending everything over to France, the, the war ended uh, somewhat abruptly in November of 1918, uh, most of the items that we were building here were intended for a major spring offensive that was scheduled for the spring of 1919, which never happened. Uh, there were a number of items that were made here in the state of Michigan that the individual soldier would have carried on his person. We know for a fact that the Frankenmuth Mullen Mill Company had a government contract to manufacture socks. Uh, there were a lot of other textile companies here in the state of Michigan at the time. Uh, Carhartt, the Carhartt Corporation made, made trousers, we know that for a fact, but other than, those are the only two actual contracts we have ever been able to, to find and verify. Uh, as far as uniforms go, uh, American soldiers in the First World War uh, often supplemented their uniforms with privately purchased and tailored items. Uh, Officers in the First World War almost exclusively had to buy their own uniforms, and there were a number of uniform companies in the state of Michigan that manufactured uniform items for, for officers. So you will very frequently find tailored uniforms that have you know, some, the, the tailor tags in them from small tailor shops in Detroit and Grand Rapids or wherever. So that, that, it's not particularly uncommon. We have several sets of the leg wraps that Joe modeled earlier in, in the museum collection that were made by Michigan tailor companies. The gas mask and the helmet that we went to war with were both British designs. Uh, we have the, uh, the British small box respirator or the corrected British small box respirator here in the front. Uh, there was a uh, Morgan and Wright Company of Detroit was one of the companies that produced those for the war effort. Uh, directly behind it, we have the helmet, the uh, M1917 helmet, which was the British tin lid. Uh, one of the major manufacturers of that, or one of the major contracts for the manufacture of the helmet was Ford Motor Company. Uh, Ford Motor Company didn't actually make them in Michigan but they subcontracted to Sparks and Whittington in Jackson, Michigan to stamp them. So they, they produced approximately half a million helmets uh, from Sparks and Whittington stamped the shells 
and then the shells would be sent to a Ford plant that was on the East Coast where they were painted and finished. Uh, that is most likely one of the few American-made items that made it over into France in any quantity before the end of the war. Down here on the floor in front of us, we have the mess kit that every American soldier would have had in that pouch on, his, on the back of his M1910 field pack. Uh, there was a contract awarded to the Edmund and Jones Company of Detroit, Michigan for the manufacture of those kits. And one of the other items of mess gear would have been your canteen, which we see directly uh, next to it here. Uh, there was no companies that we know of in the state of Michigan that made the actual canteens, but the Bradford Company of St. Joseph, Michigan was awarded a contract for the manufacture of the canvas canteen covers. So very much like you will see in the Second World War, every, everything on an American soldier from his underwear to his helmet to the vehicles he rode into battle in are very possible that it's some part of it was made here in the state of Michigan. Now we're going to jump forward about two dozen years to the Second World War. The U.S. Army underwent some changes following the Great War. Field gear was modified in the 20s and 30s. But not much was produced because of the Great Depression. The uniform also underwent some changes. The wool tunic turned into a flat collared four pocket service coat that in the late 30s and early 40s was relegated to garrison and dress details. This more practical poplin wool-lined field jacket will replace it for combat use. The breeches gave way in the late 30s to straight leg trousers. The shirt I had previously been wearing, pullover style, was replaced by a coat type shirt which had buttons going all the way down. This would be a first in United States Army history. All other shirts issued had been pullover style with a button placket but solid around the belly. The shoes are back to the shinable, uh, smooth side out finish, as we weren't fighting in trenches, so in garrison, soldiers needed to be polishing their boots. And that French overseas cap had been adopted as the garrison cap. It travels much better now that soldiers are regularly equipped with helmets. Folds up, fits in a pack or a pocket. Now this is how the Michigan soldiers of the 32nd Division would dress here in the United States. It's also how the soldiers deployed to Europe would dress for the most part in their wool service uniform with a field jacket replaced by their helm or the cap replaced by their helmet and their field equipment worn. The 32nd Division, however, would go to the Pacific Theater to fight the Japanese. Division formation in the Great War was known as the Square Division four infantry regiments, two, the 125th and 126th from Michigan, and two from Wisconsin, the 127th and 128th. Following the pre-war and early war training maneuvers, the Army began reorganizing into a triangular division, three infantry regiments. For this, the two Wisconsin regiments would still be part of the 32nd Division, but only the 126th Regiment of the Michigan National Guard would deploy as part of the 32nd Division the 125th would remain here in the United States. Next, I'll show you the uniform worn in the Pacific by these soldiers from Michigan and the other states fighting the Japanese in the tropical environment. When deployed to combat, the 32nd Division went to the Pacific Theater of Operations, the PTO, to fight the Japanese. Not all of these men came from Michigan. The National Guard was federalized, so they received volunteers and draftees from all 48 states. I am outfitted as a typical Army soldier in the Pacific Theater of War late in World War II. The uniform is the fatigue uniform. The wool service uniform would be used in combat in Europe, but the summer and tropical service uniform made of khaki cotton posed a challenge to camouflage. It was too light in color. The fatigue uniform, initially a sage green, was darkened and became the standard combat uniform of the soldiers fighting in the jungles of the Southeast Pacific. My web equipment is very similar to that of the Doughboy of World War I. My ammunition is still housed in my belt, only now it's for the U.S. rifle caliber 30 M1, commonly called the Garand. 
This is a semi-automatic rifle, whereas the 1903 is a bolt action requiring the user to manually operate it to chamber the next round, the M1 utilizes a gas system. The gases propelling the bullet down the barrel are vented to drive a gas piston, which is connected back here to the bolt. It unlocks, extracts, and ejects the spent shell, and then cocks the hammer and chambers the next round. It fires from eight round clips that are loaded completely into the action. They're pushed down, and as rounds are stripped off, the follower comes up through the clip. When the last round is chambered, a little catch comes all the way up. When the bolt comes back, it is locked rearward, ready for the next clip, and the spring steel clip ejects with an audible ping. Many myths exist that this ping would alert the enemy that the soldier was empty. Soldiers didn't fight alone, and at combat distances with artillery and other men firing and machine guns and yelling, chances of anybody actually hearing this ping are very slim. The M1 rifle utilizes the same leather sling as the 1903. It also houses its cleaning kit in the butt. Added is a little pot of grease A brush for removing sand, dirt, and debris from the action. A combination tool. The 1903 had a small screwdriver and punch that'd be carried in the soldier's pocket. The M1, to fully take it down and clean it, would sometimes require a couple of more appendages, as well as a slotted fixture to clean the bore. And a familiar nickel oiler with the brass, later steel, pull through and brush, and oil housed in half of it. Most of my other equipment will look familiar too. I have a first aid pouch. The fastener and style has changed. The contents have changed a little bit, but it's still the same thing. A sterile dressing housed in a metal tin. Later in the war, these would be replaced by foil wrappers in waxed cardboard containers to save on precious metals. Also, to fight infection, a packet of sulfonilamide powder to be sprinkled on the wound and eight or sulfadiazine tablets were contained with the first aid kit. These were made by the Upjohn Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. These would be taken unless the soldier had been hit in the neck, throat, or abdomen. They could induce nausea also abdominal wounds, you, sh you need to take a canteen full of water with these pills, and that's not advised if you've been struck in the abdomen. But otherwise, these were to fight infection. I've moved my bayonet, which I believe I failed to talk about on the Doughboy pack, from my pack to my belt. The bayonet, if you've noticed it from the World War I pack has been cut down from 16 inches to 10 inches. It's a lot handier, more of a knife than a sword. The reason I've moved that is rather than having the full pack connected to my belt, I've opted to leave my bedding back with the company luggage, as I'm not going to use that in combat, so that reduces my weight. I still have, I've moved my raincoat up to the upper pack, which is standard during World War II. I have my rations, my wash kit, and my mess kit, although some of that would be pared down and left behind as well. And I'm wearing the haversack as a backpack with the straps clipped to themselves. This way I can discard it in combat and reduce my weight. Also attached is a new shovel. This is a update that came out in 1943, began being dispersed to the troops in 1944. Rather than a small fixed shovel, this one has an adjustable angle head. It can be locked in and used as a pick for breaking ground or as a shovel for digging. 
You'll also note that I have the same canteen, although the cap to conserve on metal has been changed to Bakelite, an early form of plastic. Many soldiers would acquire a second canteen in the hot temperatures of the tropical jungles. Back to my uniform. You'll notice that the helmet has changed, the familiar M1 helmet that would serve the military from the 40s all the way up through the 1980s. It's a two-part helmet with a removable fiber liner and adjustable lining. Again, it's a hard hat protecting against fragments and minor injuries. It will not stop bullets. On my chest, I have a bandolier of ammunition, much as the Doughboy did. Ammunition came in these bandoliers in waterproof metal cans, in wooden uh, crates brought up to the front line. A soldier would grab a number of bandoliers and bring them back to his squad to be dispersed. On my feet, I am wearing the new, well, I'm wearing the updated service shoes, again, as in the trenches of World War I, with the reverse side out, the rough side out, to accept waterproofing. My leggings are canvas, and the style has changed from the early World War I to include a strap going under the boot and multiple hooks and eyelets along the side, rather than a single one in the front. I've opted to untuck my trousers from these. They're keeping debris out of my shoes, but they're also cutting off circulation of air. Untucked like this, air could come up my trousers and help to cool me. So the United States involvement in World War II was, was more in depth than our involvement in the First World War. We were in the war longer and the United States went to full industrial mobilization for the war effort. So virtually every manufacturing company in, this, in the country was in some way, shape, or form involved in the production of war assets. Uh, this is uh, very true for the state of Michigan. Uh, we have a database here at the, that we maintain at the museum. Uh, we have over, over 700 identified companies uh, and what they produced for the war effort. And a, a large number of them were items that, were, that you would see here in front of us that were actually carried by the, uh, by the American soldier. Uh, down at the far end, of, we have the, we can start with the tent and the tent pegs and the tent pole. Uh, there was a company in the Upper Peninsula, uh, Munising Wood Products, that before the war was a well-known producer of wooden bowls. Uh, they, they switched over to the manufacture of wood products for the war effort. Uh, you will find tent poles and tent pegs uh, with, marked with uh, Munising Wood Products logos on them. Uh, the tents themselves, there was a company in Alpena called Fraser Products that manufactured the tents. Uh, if we move down the line, probably the biggest, uh, one of the largest contributions to what to the American, what was visible on the American soldier is the helmet. Uh, the M1 helmet, as Joe uh, said, was the standard American helmet for the, for the Second World War and well into the 1980s. Uh, during World War II, the United States government manufactured 22 million helmets. Uh, 20 million of those were made right here in Detroit by the McCord Radiator Corporation. Uh, Joe also mentioned that the helmet had a removable liner. Uh, there were two companies here in the state of Michigan that manufactured the liners, uh, K-Pak Plastics in K-Pak, Michigan, and St. Clair Molded Rubber, which was located in Marysville. Uh, there were numerous pro companies manufacturing canvas products like the belts and the, and the web gear. Uh, there was at least one company here in the state of Michigan that made the raincoats. Uh, we've identified uh, 20, at least 20 companies in the state of Michigan that manufactured uh, clothing. Everything from underwear and socks to the uniforms, boots, trousers, shirts uh, were made here by, by Michigan companies. Because of the full industrial mobilization of industry for the Second World War and the manufacturing capabilities that existed here in the state of Michigan, the role of Michigan in the ultimate victory in the Second World War is undisputable. Okay, you can visit the museum's website at mimths.org. Uh, Please come to the museum. You can learn about Michigan's role in the defense of this nation from 1900 through the present day. Uh, 
The museum is located at 16600 Stevens in East Point, Michigan. We're just east of Grashert between 9 Mile and 10 Mile. Thank you.